Well, greetings to all of you. This is the third time I've spoken here since I've come back to Pasadena, but the first time to the church. The other two times were at college forums. I've had a little attack of the Asian flu again. I seem to get that about once every seven or eight years, and it seems to last for sometimes three, four, five weeks with a low temperature, a head cold, sore throat. But I decided I wouldn't stay away another Sabbath. I'm going to be here, and I'm going to do the best I can to bring you a message today anyway. And I believe God will give me the strength to do it. I'd like to speak today on a prophecy You know, I think we seldom think of it this way, but the Bible gives us prophecies in about two or three different categories. There's one prophecy, or series of prophecies, found several different places in the Bible, probably somewhat based on Daniel especially Daniel 2 and Daniel 7, although some of the other chapters in Daniel go along with it. In fact, the whole book, in a sense. And connected up with Revelation 13 and Revelation 17. Now, those prophecies are concerned about conditions in Satan's world, the governments of this world that are now replacing the government of God, the kingdom of God, which, of course, the kingdom of God has never been established yet. But the government of God was on this earth under angels at one time, only there was rebellion, and the angels sinned. And so we read of the angels that sinned in Second Peter, the second chapter in verse 4. Now there is another prophecy in the twelfth chapter of Revelation, which is a prophecy concerning the church, and especially the church in its relation to Satan. <clears throat> there are two churches mentioned in the book of Revelation. One is the true church of God, a small, persecuted church persecuted by Satan, persecuted by the governments of this world, which are the governments of Satan. The world doesn't realize it, of course, but they are actually the governments of Satan. Then we have the prophecies, the principal prophecy, you might say, of the New Testament is the prophecy of Jesus that you'll find in Matthew 24, and Mark 13, and Luke 21. Jesus there is speaking also of the conditions in the world and of the church on the condition of, well, the effect that the church is having in the world. What would happen in the world and those of his disciples who were in the world? I'm going to touch on some of those things, but today I'm going to take as my theme something I've never done before, the twelfth chapter of the book of Revelation. And in a sense, it spans the entire course of the church. Now, the church did not begin in the year of 31 A.D., as sometimes we mistakenly think. The New Testament church did which we call and we think of as the church. But you find the congregation of Israel, which was both the congregation of Israel and also the kingdom of Israel. It was one of the world's governments, one of the world's kingdoms or nations. But it also was a spiritual or religious, not spiritual, but a religious congregation. It was not called church, it was called congregation, but the two words mean exactly the same thing, a called-out assembly or group of people. 
And so, in a sense, the church started back there under Israel. Now, I would like to begin in Matthew, or rather in Revelation, the 13th chapter, where John says, I mean the 12th chapter, I'll get this straight after a while. I still have a little temperature in my head. If I go off the beam, well, please forgive me today, but I'm doing the best I can. But when you have a head cold and you have a temperature on the thermometer, temporarily until that gets straightened out, believe me, I am not senile, but temporarily my head goes, gets a little bit fogged up. The twelfth chapter of Revelation, there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun. Now, the book of Revelation is primarily written in symbol, symbolic language. And a woman is simply a symbol of a church. So it's speaking of a church. And this is the congregation of Israel. It was also the kingdom of Israel uh, back beginning with the days of Moses. This uh, woman was clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of twelve stars, symbolic, of course, of the twelve uh, uh, tribes of Israel. All those stars are often referred to as angels or as sometimes human leaders. And she, being with child, cried, traveling in birth, and pained to be delivered. In other words, Christ was born of the tribe of Judah, of the kingdom of ancient Israel, although Judah had split off and become a separate kingdom in the, after the, uh, in the days of Rehoboam after the death of King Solomon. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and uh, behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. Now that ties right in with Revelation 13 and also uh, to a certain extent Revelation 17, although the same symbols are not in the 17th chapter. But it is referring to the governments of this world under Satan that you find in Daniel 2, Daniel uh, 7, and in Revelation 13 and 17. Of course, that great red dragon, as we see as we proceed, is Satan the devil. And his tail drew a third part of the stars of heaven, that is, a third of the angels. Stars, again, are a symbol of angels, and they are sometimes used as a symbol of human leaders or human messengers. His tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. That, of course, is the Christ child, born of Judah. Jesus came to his own, the tribe of Judah, the kingdom of Judah. His own re received him not. But Satan tried to devour through the Roman king and through the Roman government that was in uh, uh, authority in Palestine at the time, as soon as Jesus was born. God had to warn Joseph and Mary, Mary was the mother of Jesus, to flee with the Christ child into Egypt until King Herod, I believe it was Herod one, that was dead. And then they came back and they went up to Nazareth where Jesus was brought up. And <clears throat> He failed in that attempt. Again, Satan tried to devour Jesus when he was 30 years old before he began to preach, before he began his ministry. But she brought forth the man-child who was to rule all nations. So much in the Bible speaks of Jesus as a coming king. The prophecies in the book of Isaiah for instance, in Isaiah 9, verses 6 and 7, speaking of Jesus as a coming king, 
to rule over nations and that his kingdom would endure forever. It was spoken to Mary before Jesus was born by the angel. Jesus said he was born to be a king, and for that cause he came into the world. But his kingdom was not of this time, this age, or this world. This is Satan's world. And his kingdom is for the world tomorrow, which is soon to dawn now in our time. She brought forth this child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. Now there, quickly, it travels over the time from ancient Israel, the birth of Christ, Satan's attack, Jesus' ministry, his death, his resurrection, his ascension to heaven, caught up to God. All that has been covered in that little space that I have just read to you. And the woman, the church, fled into the wilderness. Now we get into the Middle Ages. Part of the time the church had to flee. About the year of 53 A.D., when the Apostle Paul uh, wrote the book of Galatians, you find that the gospel was already beginning to be suppressed. Jesus came, preached the gospel, taught it to his disciples, who became the original apostles, the original leaders of the church. And the church, of course, followed that doctrine and that teaching. And that began in 31 A.D., but by 53 A.D., the church had hardly become of age. And false doctrines were being substituted, counterfeit uh, gospels were coming. Primarily a gospel, uh, as it turned out to be later, about the messenger who brought the gospel message. Now we're going to see just a little later that Christ was the messenger of the new covenant. He brought that message, and he came as a messenger. And that message was his gospel. But it was the government again, under Satan, that persecuted the church. <clears throat> They had to meet secretly, and they finally even had to flee in through the mountains, through the Middle Ages, the Waldenses and other people like that, where a place was prepared of God that they should, should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. That's twelve hundred and sixty years. Now that particular twelve hundred and sixty years is not synonymous with the 1260 years of the revival of the ancient Roman Empire. It was revived in 554 as the Holy Roman Empire, and it lasted 1260 years until Napoleon's Waterloo, as we call it, in the year of 1814, and that was 1260 years, but that is a different 1260 years, apparently. Anyway, that carries us through the Middle Ages and brings us up to approximately our time now. So you notice how, how many years are covered in just a few short verses here in this twelfth chapter. Now this twelfth chapter of, da of, of Revelation will cover clear up to the second coming of Christ. Now I want to begin to fill in other prophecies with it and some of the other things that are not mentioned at this place. Uh, I'd like to... Uh, to show you first one thing about a duality, uh, the 1260 days. Uh, there were two of those, and they were not synonymous, but this flight of the woman into the wilderness was, symbol or, 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 or was a forerunner of a uh, duality of prophecy, you might say, of the church today, this church, our church that is to be taken on the two wings of a great eagle to a place of safety. And it's time that we get back to that again now. And I notice that some of our ministers are beginning to speak on it. And it's time that we get back to it. I have not said much about it now for about 20, 25 years. 
because at least one minister was ridiculing the whole idea as much as the Bible was ridiculed uh, at the time. And again, I was only speaking about this time of fleeing to, or not fleeing, but being taken to a place of safety. Uh, I guess I was just ahead of my time a little bit. I was in a lot of things. Way back in the time of World War II and even prior to World War II, I was speaking a great deal on the air about the Day of the Lord. I thought it would be here almost immediately. Yes, I was wrong. But you see, Peter was wrong and all of the original apostles and the apostle Paul was wrong. They thought the coming of Christ was going to be immediately in their time, in their generation, 1950 years ago. So they were wrong. And of course, I had to be a little wrong too or ahead of my time. And so I have not been speaking so much about the day of the Lord now for some 25 or 30, no, it's more than 30, 35 years or more. But it's time to get back to that now because we're coming into that time very quickly now. That's one reason I've selected this subject to speak to you today. I want you to know the time we're in now. Where are we in the time of prophecy as a church? As I say, some of the prophecies speak about conditions in the world. This speaks of the condition of the church in, re in relation to Satan. Now, at that point, I want to go back to Matthew 24, and I want to cover the first uh, uh, five uh, uh, verses back here. Matthew 24, well, Jesus was speaking to his disciples in the temple, or at the temple. Jesus said unto them, See ye not all of these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. He was speaking of the temple, all the buildings of the temple, and it was to be destroyed. Now that did happen in their lifetime. That happened in the year of 70 A.D. He was probably speaking to them around 29 or 30 A.D. Or it might have even gotten into the beginning of 31 A.D. <clears throat> and later now, as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? What things? He'd been speaking about the destruction of the temple. But now they ask another question. And what shall be the sign of thy coming in the end of the age? The reason they tacked that question on was because they thought it was going to happen in, th in their lifetime the same as the destruction of the temple did happen in their lifetime. So here was Jesus' answer to them. Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and shall deceive many. Many will come in Jesus' name, saying, Jesus is the Christ. If Jesus speaking, he said, others will come in my name saying, I am the Christ. Not saying they are the Christ. I know there was a man named Nish uh, Nishnamurti, I believe his name was, brought over by a woman named Anne, uh, Annie Besant or something like that from India, claiming to be Christ. And I think a man claiming to be Christ walked into one of our offices across the way over here one day and said, I am Jesus Christ. But the answer was, well, if you're Christ, I won't be able to grab you by the neck of the neck and the seat of the pants and throw you out of here. And he got him out and dusted off his hand and says, no, I decided you're not Christ. And uh, he got thrown out of the office. Or uh, I don't think he was really manhandled. I, I may have exaggerated, it, exaggerated that a bit, but he was put out. Anyway... Jesus told them what would happen in their lifetime first. And he didn't tell them what would be the sign of his coming, because that was going to be more than 1900 years later, until a little later. 
So he started out and he said that many will come in my name saying I am the Christ, deceiving the many. Now that happened in our time. The gospel was suppressed. Another gospel was given. But they claimed to be the ministers of Jesus Christ. Satan claims to be the, and is the God of this world and claims to be. Now, Jesus didn't come to answer the second question until we get down here to verse 14, because that didn't happen in their lifetime. And this gospel which he was preaching, this gospel of the kingdom, shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. And then shall the end come. Now, Jesus was preaching the gospel of the kingdom. As I said, another gospel suppressed it, supplanted it. The gospel of the kingdom was not preached for 1,900 years. That's 100 time cycles. Now, God put the sun, the moon, in the heavens in relation to the earth to mark off certain spaces of time. One day is marked off by one revolution of the earth as it is measured by the sun, by a, what appears to be a sunset to us. Actually, the sun isn't setting, it's the earth that just turned past the sun. The week is measured by God's Sabbath, not by the sun or moon or the earth, but by God's Sabbath. But the month is measured by the moon. And one revolution, 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 yes, of the uh, uh, of the moon around the Earth is one lunar month, and one revolution uh, of the Earth around the sun is a solar year. <clears throat> now, those three bodies—the sun, the moon, and the Earth—which mark off time come into precise, or, or almost precise, conjunction once in 19 years. Now that's another thing that has been scoffed at by those who will not go along with the true teaching of Christ and of God and of the Bible. But there is a 19-year time cycle, and 19 years is a cycle of time as measured by the sun, the moon, and the earth. Apparently, the gospel was suppressed about 53 A.D. It went on the most powerful radio station on earth after it had gone coast to coast in the United States for one time cycle of exactly 19 years, beginning in 1934 on the first Sunday, the beginning of January, and in the first week of January 1953, 19 years later, the gospel began going to the world, and that was one century of time cycles from the time it apparently was suppressed, according to Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. God does things right on time, and we need to sort of wake up to that fact and realize it. Maybe we should be on time a little better than we always are. Now, let's get the time now. That gospel is going to the world. And it has gone through this church and through the one that God raised up as the leader of this church. That gospel has been going to the world for the first time in 1900 years. And you know, it's another funny thing. Today is the crucifixion anniversary of the death of Christ. We celebrated that last night as a memorial. And it is 1950. In other words, it is a century of time cycles plus 50 years, exactly, from the time that Christ did die. God does do things on time. All right, now Revelation 3. And in verse 1 I'd like to read, 
and unto the angel of the church of Sardis. You remember the notice that these messages in the second and third or the third yes second and third chapters of uh, the book of Revelation. The actual message is given to the angel of the church. Now that word comes from the Greek word. Uh, I don't know whether they pronounce it angelus or angelus or angelos. But it is also translated in many cases, messenger speaking of a human messenger, like John the Baptist, for example. And uh, uh, it, it could be either. In any event, it is not speaking just to an angel. It is speaking either of and to a human messenger of the church and leader, or it is speaking to the church as a whole. But under the angel of the church of Sardis write, These things saith he that uh, uh, hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars that you found in the first chapter, I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest, and art dead. That church was spiritually dead. I came among that church myself. I came among that church back in 19, I first heard of them in the latter part of 1926 and beginning in 1927. And they were spiritually dead. But they did have the right name. They still went by the name Church of God. They were the Church of God. They did ob believe in obeying God to the extent that they kept the Sabbath. But they had lost so very, very much of the truth. They had lost a very great deal of it. They didn't know about the annual Sabbath. They only knew the one weekly Sabbath. They didn't know about the kingdom of God. They didn't know what the true gospel was. Instead of the true gospel of the kingdom of God, they were preaching what they called the third angel's message, which is not a gospel at all, just something that's mentioned. Whether that is a real angel or another human messenger, uh, must be decided, but uh, uh, nevertheless, that's mentioned in Revelation. Most people have never even noticed it there, but they made a whole gospel out of it. Now, uh, we come on to the next church, because I came among them, and God did use me in the raising up of this church. So now we come to uh, verse 7 and to the angel of the church in Philadelphia. Now, this is the Philadelphia era now, following the Sardis era. Of Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, and that openeth and no man shutteth, and that shutteth and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door. An open door. You'll find that Paul explains how an open door was opened before him to preach the gospel, to go to another place and preach the gospel. It's a door that is an opening to preach the gospel of the kingdom of God. And no man can shut it. They've tried to shut it, but they've never been able. For Thou hast a little strength, and often that is translated but a little strength. You have very little strength. Very little strength. My name may be Armstrong, but only is the arm supposed to be strong, and, and it is not as strong as it's supposed to be. I might just mention that in passing. And hast kept my word and has not denied my name. I'd like to tell you one thing, one difference between the raising up of this church and the other churches in the world today. You take the leader or the founder of any church. Take the Wesleys as founder of the Methodist Church, Luther as founder of the Lutheran Church, any of them that you want, and ask, where did they get their teaching that they taught to their followers as the doctrines of their church? How did they get it, and from whom did they get it? And in every case they got it from other men. 
They got it from other people. They did not get it from Christ. So where did the original apostles get it? They got it from Jesus Christ in person. Now, get this. Jesus Christ in person is the personal Word of God. He is the Word of God in person. But the Bible here is the Word of God in writing, and it's the same word exactly. Now, I had been raised and taught by men in one of these Protestant churches, a respected church, yes. I turned in my study when I was challenged, and I was trying to have my own way, and I was trying to prove just the opposite of what the Bible says, as a matter of fact. That is, I hoped I'd find that was true. I wasn't, uh, I wasn't trying to prove the Bible wrong and from that point of view. That's why I mean it. But I mean, I was trying to prove that what is right is the opposite of what the Bible says. And I came across my, uh, uh, Romans 6.23. The wages of sin is death. And I said, well, that's not what I've been taught. What I've been taught by men is that the wages of sin is eternal life. Of course, it's eternal life in hell fire. That's a little different than, than heaven. But it still was eternal life. You're going to live forever and burn forever and never burn up. You'd be suffering and suffering, suffering every second as long as you, well, as long as you live, you'd live forever because you're an immortal soul. Then I read the last half of that verse, and it says, But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Well, that can't be right. I've already got eternal life. Why do I have to get it as a gift from God? Something I already have. I'm an immortal soul. Well, I have an immortal soul, whichever. That's what I suppose. Do you know, as I went a little further in the Bible, I found other things that weren't what I supposed. I found Jesus said, No man has ascended up to heaven. I found where in the first inspired sermon on the day of Pentecost, Peter said, David has not ascended into the heavens, and his, uh, uh, his sepulcher is here with us even to this day. And David is a man after God's own heart, and David has not ascended into heaven. Jesus said no man was. Then I looked up the immortal soul, and I found the soul that sinneth that shall die, and that's stated twice in the Bible. Now I found Jesus uh, 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 talked to a couple of souls, Adam and Eve, and in in the uh, uh, let's see the second chapter of Genesis in verse seven, God formed man of the dust of the ground. Now what is man is formed of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man formed of the dust of the ground became a living soul, not an immortal soul. So what became a soul came out of the ground. Not spirit, not immortal life, but something out of the ground that had to breathe air to live. And in other places in the Bible you find that the blood thereof is the life thereof. So we got a chemical existence from the breathing of air, the circulation of blood, the eating of food, and the drinking of water to constantly give us fuel. And that's what keeps us going. It's just a chemical, temporary existence. It's not life. We don't have life. Adam was offered life in the Garden of Eden, but he didn't take it. All he had was a temporary te chemical existence. He didn't have life. That's why you read in Ephesians 2, verse 1, that the people in Ephesus had been dead in trespasses and sins. They hadn't been alive. They were dead. But now they're alive by having the Holy Spirit of God. People that do not have the Spirit of God do not have life. They are dying every day they live. From the minute they were born, from the second they were born, they began dying. Dying is a long process. Sometimes it takes a couple or three hours, and some little infants die right about the time they're born. Some take seven years before they die, and some few of us have lived quite a little longer than that, but not too many. But it's a temporary existence. 
Now, the Bible says it's appointed to man once to die, and as in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be made alive. We need to remember those things as we go along. Well, let's see. Now, he said he would open a door. I think I want to come back to that a little bit uh, uh, later, and I won't read the rest of that right now. Uh, I'd like to turn now back to Malachi. Last book in the Old Testament, Malachi 3. And I'd like to read a little more than verse 1 this time. We usually stop at the end of verse 1. You don't get the real meaning if you stop there. Behold, it's a prophecy, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. Who's speaking? Why, the Lord. Jesus Christ was the God of the Old Testament. He's the Word of God. And the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple. Now, we want to know something about that temple, too. Christ is coming to a temple. And he did come to a temple when he came, didn't he? All right. Even the messenger of the covenant. Jesus came as the messenger of the new covenant. Moses was the mediator of the old covenant. The new is a different covenant based on better promises, but the same law. Uh, which you delight in, behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. But who may abide the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire, and like fuller's soap. And he shall sit as a refiner in a purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi, and shall purge them as gold and silver. And they, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness, then shall the offering of Judah and uh, Jerusalem be, pre be uh, pleasant to the Lord as in the days of old uh, uh, and as in the former years. And I will come near unto you to judgment, and I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers, against adulterers, and against uh, uh, false swearers, and against a lot of other people. Now, what, what I want to ask you is, did that happen when Christ came? The answer is no, it didn't. Those things didn't happen at all. Those are all things that are going to take place when Christ comes the second time. Therefore, this is speaking primarily of the second coming of Christ and not the first. But remember I said there's a duality, and a first, it, there's the first Adam and the second Adam. There's the old covenant, there's the new covenant. There was the government of God. There's going to come later the kingdom of God, and the government of God will be restored to the earth. God often does things in a dual manner. In fact, most prophecies are fulfilled that way. Now I'll go back. I will send a messenger to prepare the way before me, and the Lord will suddenly come to his temple. And it's speaking about the second coming. What temple is he coming to? What temple is he coming to? And who is to prepare the way? Now, you will read in Mark, the first chapter, you'll read it in Matthew, and I, yes, I believe it's in Luke too, that John the Baptist uh, really sort of fulfilled that prophecy. He prepared the way before Christ. But this is speaking really of the second coming and not the first coming, and John the Baptist just prepared the way before, before Christ's first coming. So this is really speaking of a second coming. Now there's another prophecy I'd like to read to you back here in uh, uh, Haggai, in the second chapter. Here was Haggai building a temple, a temple to which Christ came the first time. John the Baptist prepared the way before his coming the first time. Let's get something about the preparation of the temples of the first time and the second time. Um, the temple had been destroyed at Jerusalem, that is Solomon's temple, that was so glorious, you know, 
probably the finest building ever built on earth. I, I don't know whether St. Peter's at Rome would be considered finer now today or not. It's ugly and filthy and dirty, though, and Solomon's temple was just bristling with uh, shiny gold and silver and beautiful things. It was very, very beautiful. Of course, St. Peter's Basilica in Rome is beautiful in a way, but it is dirty. But uh, in uh, Zechariah 4, verses 6 and 9, this is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. He's talking of the type of the forerunner of one who would have very little strength or very little power or spirit. You can't do it in your own power. You haven't got it. You're a human being. You do it by the Spirit and the power of the living God. Brethren, I didn't build this building here. I had something to do with it, though. But it was Jesus Christ who built this building. It, I didn't build this campus. Jesus Christ did. But he used me in doing it. And I had something to do with designing almost every inch of this building and every inch of this campus. And I knew that God had shown me he wanted it to be beautiful. Three times we have won the award of being the most beautiful, the best landscaped and best man maintained campus in the United States of America. God's campus ought to be, and it is. And I say praise be to God, not to any human being, because we're only instruments. I didn't do it. Christ did it. To him goes all the credit and glory. It's been done by faith. It's been done by the power of the Spirit of God. Let's realize that. I've noticed in this work that when some men get advanced to a certain higher position, they want to climb a little higher in the work. They want a little bigger salary. It isn't always a bigger salary they want. Often it's a little more power. They want the power. And God doesn't give it to them. And many of them are out, out in the world, out in the cold, cold world, going nowhere. They are just like, oh, that man back in Moses' time, why can I think of his name, uh, Korah, and the people with him. Moses said to him, they said, Cora, you had a high position. You had been elevated to quite a lot of authority, but it wasn't enough. You wanted more authority. You wanted, you were thinking of yourself and your position and how much position you could get. What did God do? Moses didn't do it. God did. God just let the earth fall, fall away from under them, and they sank down, and the earth swallowed them up and covered them. And they were buried alive. And God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Well, today, there are those that do that are coming to nothing. Those that get to glorifying themselves and want power for themselves, God doesn't give it to them. He just does not give it to them. There's one other verse I'd like to read here, verse 9. The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. Now that was a type of the house or the temple to which Christ is coming. His hands shall finish it, and thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts has sent me unto you. If, that, if he was a type, I hope that the one he's a type of will finish the work and will be kept alive. So I go back to Isaiah 40 in the last three or four verses there, and I find how God renews our youth like the eagles, and how God can keep us alive and can even bring us back from death as he has brought me back from death, because I died and I was brought back.
Now, what about the, uh, uh, what about the temple? I'd like to turn to something I hadn't, I didn't have it marked here and didn't intend to, but I want to turn to it, to Ephesians. Ephesians, the second chapter. And just a few words here. Now, therefore, you, that's the church at Ephesus, and this would be the same as the church of God anywhere, that day or not today or any time. You are no more strangers and foreigners. They had been Gentiles, but are uh, fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. Now, if they're citizens, they're speaking of the, uh, their, their, their citizenship in a nation. They're no more foreigners, but they're also of the household of God. Now they're speaking of a family. A household is a family. So they're in a family relationship with, uh, with the family of God and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Now he's talking about them being a building. In whom all the building, that's the church, the church is a building, all the building fitly framed together groweth unto and holy what? A holy temple in the Lord. That's the temple to which Christ is coming. People have argued about, are the Jews going to uh, destroy the Dome of the Rock that the uh, Arabs have in Jerusalem, standing on the very site where Solomon's temple once did and where the temple did the, to which Christ came the first time? And are the Jews going to build a temple for him to come? Oh, no. The temple that's speaking of is a spiritual temple. Now, someone is to prepare the way for his coming. John the Baptist prepared the way for his first coming. John the Baptist was a voice crying out in the physical wilderness of the Jordan River. And he was preparing the way for a physical Jesus to come in the human flesh. And he was coming to his physical temple belt of stone that Zerubbabel built. Now, just as John the Baptist may have been a type, so Zerubbabel was a type of the one that would build the second temple. That is, that Christ would use in the building. Because actually it's God doing all these things anyway. Now, God doing it through Christ, and Christ does it through the Holy Spirit. But he came the first time to the physical temple and to a physical human, Judah. And he came announcing that he would bring about the kingdom of God. But that was to be more than 1,900 years in the future. Was that a type of someone crying out in the spiritual wilderness of religious confusion of this 20th century? of the spiritual Christ coming in power and glory, not as a physical Jesus, but the God Jesus, in power and glory to his spiritual temple that will meet him in the air, in the clouds. The dead in Christ of that temple will rise first. We which are alive and remain will be changed instantly from mortal to immortal and rise and meet him as immortal people far more glorious temple than Solomon's, a spiritual temple. That's what we shall be. Your faces won't be the color they are now, pale or whatever color they are. Your faces will all be as bright as the sun itself, full strength. Your eyes will be like flames of fire. You will be spiritual. You will be composed of spirit. You'll have life, and you won't be dead. You'll have life. You'll have the kind of life so you never can die. You'll have the kind of life that can never be unhappy. You shall always have joy and happiness. You shall always want to help others and do good as God does. And he's coming this time 
to establish the kingdom of God, which is a spiritual kingdom, which is the household of God, the family of God, that will restore the government of God on this earth and put away Satan the devil. That is what is going to happen. Now, we're just tracing the, the history of the church here and its relation with Satan the devil and some of these things. I want to get this history of it over to you. So now we'll go back to Revelation 12 once again. And verses beginning with verse 7. Now we get down to our present time. And here this church has been raised up by one that God taught through the printed Word of God. The Word it was taught by the printed Word as the original apostles were by the personal Word. Same words exactly. You tell me any other religious leader in the world that got his religion that way and gave it out to the whole church that way. There is none. This is the only church that has been built that way, brethren. You are the only ones that have that precious knowledge. And much of that knowledge had been lost through the Middle Ages. And God has restored it. And you have knowledge that the church didn't have a hundred years ago, two hundred, three hundred, five hundred, seven hundred years ago. You are privileged to have that wonderful knowledge. Do you appreciate it? Do you value it? Do you realize how precious it is? It's time we wake up and that we do realize. Or I begin with verse 7. Now, I had read the first six verses back here in Revelation 12. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought on his angels, and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world, the whole world, not part of it, all of it. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Now that is right near the time of the coming of Christ, because the next word say, and I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God. Salvation comes at the second coming of Christ and the kingdom of God. So this is prior, just prior, oh, it could be as much as 10 or 15 years or 30 years prior, but it's, it's getting close as considering the time of the thousands of years that things have been going on here on the earth and 1950 years for the church itself, comparatively short time. But the great dragon was cast out. Let, no, wait a minute. No, this war in heaven, Michael won it. This is, again, there's duality. You read back in uh, the... Uh, uh, in, in Isaiah uh, uh, 14 of uh, how uh, the archangel Lucifer had been put on a throne on this earth and said, I will exalt my throne above the stars of heaven. I will ascend. And he was going to knock God off the throne and take over the whole universe. You also read of him in Ezekiel 28 where he was perfect in all of, all of his ways from the day he was created until iniquity was found in him. The great archangel Lucifer became Satan the devil. He had tried to uh, swoop up to heaven with his angels and knock God off the throne. He was cast down. There's a duality. It's happened again, and I think that has happened just recently in our time. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us when. We have to judge by what has happened, by the fruit you know, and what are the fruits? What has happened? The persecuting power always was the governments of this world, the governments of Satan. Satan persecutes through his government, the world's governments, the world's kingdoms, the world's laws.
They are all masterminded by Satan the devil. It's time that a lot of people begin to wake up to that fact. Because they exalt the governments of this world, the courts of this world. The Bible speaks of the unjust judge. When it comes to judges in the courts of this world, there isn't justice there. And we should have learned it in the recent lawsuit where the government tried to overthrow and take over this church and did not succeed and shall not succeed because this is the church of the living God. And God did protect this church and did preserve it. And he said the gates of the grave will never prevail against it. And this is the only church that, that, was, that Jesus was talking about at that time. Now, let's go on here in this. 12th chapter again of Revelation. There's the, the loud voice in heaven saying, Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ, for the accuser of our brethren is cast down. When people begin to accuse the brethren, they are doing the work of Satan. And I've heard a lot of that in the last three or four months accusing the people and the leaders of God. Satan is the accuser of the brethren, which accused them day and night before God, uh, before our God, day and night. That's what he was doing up in heaven. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. It, I don't think that is speaking of the time of a martyrdom. That is yet to come. But I think our people did not love their lives unto death. When you filled this auditorium and the hall of administration and the other buildings so that the officials of government could not get in, and you were holding religious services so they were afraid to enter and disturb a religious service. God was with us in the power of God. Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and ye that dwell them in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and uh, of the sea. For the devil has come down unto you with great wrath, because he knows he has but a short time. How does he know? How does he know that he has but a short time? Jesus said, when this gospel of the kingdom is proclaimed to the world, then shall the end come. Satan knows that's been going around. He knows he has but a short time. Many people don't know that, though. I wonder if we know it in God's church. It's time we do know it. He knows he has but a short time. And when the dragon, which is the devil, saw that he was cast under the, under the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. That is us. And he has been persecuting us, and he will continue to persecute us. Satan is not through. And we're going to be persecuted from now until Christ does come and put Satan away. So prepare for it, brethren. And if it doesn't hit you, maybe you don't belong to Christ as much as you think you do. To the woman were given the two wings of a great eagle. When this persecution comes to its full strength, it hasn't come to that yet. The two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness unto her place. God has a place. And there is a place. where she is nourished for a time, times, and half a time. This time it'll be three and a half years. Now the time, time, and half a time, that's 1260 days. And at the end time, when you come down to this end time, a day is a day being fulfilled. But prior to that, back in history, a day is a year being fulfilled in prophecy. Now back in Numbers and in the Old Testament, you find the key to that. It's all explained. I can't go into that today, but... 
I hope you've read much of our literature or heard it preached and so that you understand all of that. Anyway, she is uh, from the face of the serpent. This twelfth chapter is showing us the history of the church, and if that is the future history from Christ's time, in relation to the devil. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as of a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened up her mouth and swallowed up the flood, not the woman, which uh, the dragon had cast out of his mouth. Now that leaves one verse yet that I'll come to later. Now I want to fulfill, uh, fill in a few other verses at this point. Next I want to go back to Matthew 24. What is just coming next now and what we're leading into, it's a result of Satan's wrath and uh, we will uh, very soon be coming to it. Matthew 24 and uh, uh, verses 21 and 22. Now this is coming very soon now. We're almost up to that time. There shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world of this time, known or ever shall be, and except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved alive. It's speaking of keeping humanity alive, not spiritual salvation in that case. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. That is the great tribulation. And this church is to be taken to a place of safety for that three and a half years of that great tribulation. Now at this point, I'd like to turn back to a prophecy in the Old Testament again in Joel 2 and verse 31. The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood, before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. Now, that's before the day of the Lord. Now, I want to show you here in verse 29 of Matthew 24, immediately after the tribulation of those days, this after the great tribulation, thou shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven shall be shaken. But that'll be before the day of the Lord. So you see, first comes the great tribulation. After that, the signs and the sun and the moon and the stars. After that, the day of the Lord. And Christ comes in the day of the Lord or very soon after its beginning. And I don't know whether that's a few days, a few weeks, or a few months. I don't know. I don't think it's a few years. But God doesn't give us the time. So I don't know and you don't know. Now back to Revelation 6 this time. Revelation 6. And I want to show you about the sun and the moon being dark. Beginning with verse 12 in Revelation 6. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake. Now this follows the great tribulation, which is the fifth seal in this chapter in Revelation. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs. And I think that means it has to be a meteor shower, and not, not stars that are bigger than our sun, of course, uh, when she was shaken with a mighty wind. And uh, the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together. And every mountain and every island were moved out of their places. And uh, the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said unto the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us! and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, because they see the sight of this in heaven. And it's going to frighten them, as they've never been frightened in all their lives. They're going to want to die and seek death and won't be able to. 
For the great day of thy of his wrath, God's wrath, is come, and who shall be able to stand? The great tribulation is really caused by Satan's wrath. But the day of the Lord has come and will come upon us as a result of God's wrath on Satan and the people that are following his way. Now, I, I'd like to go on just to mention a, a little bit about the seventh chapter of Revelation here while I'm on it. Uh, after these things, there were four angels uh, holding up uh, uh, the... Uh, four winds of the earth, that they should not blow on the earth, the sea, or the trees, and so on. And then uh, uh, appeared the 144,000 and another great innumerable multitude of all nations. Now when they ask who are they, they are people that come to Christ out of the great tribulation. A great, not revival, but a, a, a great conversion of people is going to happen as a result or during the Great Tribulation. Many people have heard our message, millions have heard it, that we have not heard from, believe me. They haven't paid too much attention to it now, but when these things happen, they'll say that was the truth that we heard. They've heard it on television, they've heard it on radio, they've read it in the plain truth. Millions of copies of The Plain Truth are going out now every month, over two million. And I hope that we'll get it built back up over three million again very soon. We are reaching millions of people. And I, I think we don't realize it. We don't hear from all of those millions. We just hear from those that are a little bit interested. So many of them, they get it, they say, oh, yeah, and they go on, and they don't pay much attention. But believe you me, they're going to pay attention when the Great Tribulation comes. Now, we're in a time of trouble now, such as the world never had before. But it's going to be a lot worse than this. This is a forerunner, you might say, of the Great Tribulation that we're into uh, right now. Now, those of the 144,000, the great innumerable multitude, they will be the Laodicean church that is to follow this church. The Laodicean church has not appeared as yet. You want to know about that? Well, that's it. It will come out of the, the, the Great Tribulation. Um, you find uh, the Laodicean church in Revelation 3, and uh, again in Matthew 25. The Laodicean church, they're lukewarm. They're only half filled with the Holy Spirit. But now I'd like to have you notice in uh, Matthew 25, just a moment. Here's something you might devote a lot of time to in studying. Matthew 25, beginning with verse 1. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins. Now that's speaking of those in the church, in the ten virgins. This ties up with the ten pounds and also the ten, uh, uh, the parable that follows this, of uh, the ten, uh, uh, of the parable of the talents. I don't know, that wasn't ten, was it? But the pounds were ten. And uh, the, the result, it's, it, they're talking about the church in this time before Christ comes. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins. That's the church in this whole church age, which uh, took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. They were told of the second coming of Christ over 1,900 years ago. Now their lamps, the symbolic, as I say, Revelation is symbolic. Thy word is a lamp unto our feet, the Bible says. The lamps then are the Bible. Now these were a Bible-loving people. They didn't have Bibles to take back in the days of Christ, but they, they took the word of God that they had heard proclaimed nevertheless but they didn't have oil, the Holy Spirit. Now, I want you to notice something right here. Five of them were wise, and five of them were foolish, and they that were foolish took their lamps, but took no oil with them. But the wise took oil, not in the lamps, took oil in the vessels with their lamps. Now, the lamp is the Bible. The lamp is the Word of God. But the vessel that they took the oil in was the person. 
and in your mind. And you can't understand the Bible without the Holy Spirit. The oil is the Holy Spirit. And those that were foolish did not have the Holy Spirit. They had the Bible, but they couldn't understand it correctly because they didn't have the Holy Spirit. And at midnight. Now, that's the way it's been for 1,900 years, but now we get down to our time. They thought Christ was coming right then in their day. Paul thought so. Peter thought so. He didn't come then. But you know, while the bridegroom tarried, Christ didn't come that soon. They all slumbered and slept. The whole church slumbered and slept. And in that slumber and sleep, they lost sight of the second coming of Christ. They forgot, and the second coming of Christ was not proclaimed through the Middle Ages. The second coming of Christ, there was a duality there. And the first, it began with the William Miller movement in 1843, or just prior to 1843. And he had it all figured that Christ was coming in 1843 on a certain date. I forget the date. You can research it and look it up if you want to get it. He didn't come on that date. And so a lot of people were terribly discouraged. He tried to set the date. You can't do that, of course. But uh, a lot of people followed a woman, a Mrs. Ellen G. White. And that developed into what became, and they were people of the Church of God for a while, but they then had a meeting about 1860 and they changed the name to Seventh-day Adventist. But they also had proclaimed the second coming of Christ, but they got it all wrong. Christ was only coming to meet us as we were going to have it, where the Bible says that we're going to meet him in the, in the clouds as he comes to the earth. So they invented their doctrine of the investigative judgment in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And uh, they had their doctrine of the 2300 days and uh, the spirit of prophecy and some of their particular Seventh-day Adventist doctrines. So they wanted to get rid of the word of the name Church of God. They threw it away and adopted the name Seventh-day Adventist. The Church of God continued on. Its headquarters would move from a place in Iowa to uh, Stanbury, Missouri, by the time I came among them back in 1926 and 7. Now we're getting down to our time. But people didn't believe it, and they didn't have the truth about it, or the purpose of Christ's coming, or what he's coming for, or anything about it. It was not the gospel. But... And at midnight, there was a cry made. I guess it's like they expected him about 7 or 8 o'clock, and they went to sleep, you know. Makes me think of when I was in a church to see the old century out in the new century in. I was seven and a half years old. 1899 was going out, and the year 1900 was just coming in. I was just a little kid, seven and a half years old, and they made me sit there in church until midnight. There was no program. There was no music. There was no speaking. Nothing. I wanted to turn over and go to sleep like these virgins. My parents wouldn't let me. My dad, dad and my father would kind of thump me on the side of the head once in a while. He'd say, wake up there, son. And uh, i try to wake up, but it was very difficult. But these virgins were sleeping, and they lost a lot of the gospel. But at midnight, there was a cry made, a voice started to, started to cry out now in the spiritual wilderness of the 20th century, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Now, as I say, there was a one-two there, a one-two shot, uh, type and anti-type or whatever you want to call it. And uh, William Miller gave a little bit of something about it in 18... The 43 or just prior to that time. But we've been proclaiming it, and people haven't paid too much attention to it, but still there are thousands in God's church today, and it is the worldwide church of God, and we are worldwide today. 
Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. That is, they began to dust off the Bible and look into it a little bit. And, but the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. Or they're going out, as some of the other translations have it. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, but go, uh, there, lest there be not enough for us and for you, but go you rather to those that sell and buy for yourselves. You know, you sort of have to buy the Holy Spirit when you stop to think about it. You have to give up, not money. You don't give up money. You have to give up yourself. You have to give up your own way of life. You have to repent, and you have to begin to believe. And you have to give yourself to God. And that's the way you receive the Holy Spirit. I was writing something this morning. I won't take time on it. How do people get demon possession? And how do they get the Spirit of God? There's quite a difference. Great contrast between those two, but I won't go into that now. While they went to buy, the bridegroom came, the second coming of Christ. And they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us. But he answered and said, Verily, verily, I know you not. When they didn't have the Holy Spirit, they didn't have the life of God, and he did not know them. It made me think there are a lot that understand part of the Bible, but they have never received the Spirit of God. Just believing certain parts of the Bible doesn't save you, brethren. The Spirit of God is a different spirit, a different attitude that comes into you. It does not possess you like a demon might possess you, but it will open your mind to understand and comprehend the Bible. And the Holy Spirit of God will lead the way and will show you the way and say, this is the way, walk you in it. And the question is whether you will do it or not. Well, at that time, now we get back to Matthew 24 again, just one verse here. Oh, my. I've got so many scriptures here, I get lost trying to go from one to the other. Matthew 24 and verse 30. I read 29 a while ago. And, uh, uh, now wait a minute. No chapter. And then shall appear after the signs and the sun and the moon and the stars that I read in verse 29, uh, shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And that will be the second coming of Christ. Now we've turned back to finish Revelation 12, and uh, the final verse, verse 17. And the dragon was wroth with the woman, that's the church, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. The remnant is the last part, the tag end of a bowl of cloth in the, that you buy in a dry goods store. And uh, the remnant, then, is the Laodicean church. that keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. A lot of them may be commandment keepers, but they won't have the Spirit of God. That is a spirit and an attitude. We have to have the life of God, the Spirit of God, uh, within us. Now, in the Re Revelation 11 and verse 15, Finally, to just bring this down to something complete, Revelation 11 and verse 15, again, and then the seventh angel sounded, and uh, there were great voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world, that's all the governments of this earth, are become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ. And he shall reign even forever and ever. 
And then you go on to the 20th and the 19th chapter, and that you'll find how Christ is coming as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And then in the 20th chapter, how Satan is taken away. And the saints will rule with Christ in the kingdom of God. And so that will complete the history of the church up to the coming of Christ as it is in the 12th chapter of the book of Revelation and other scriptures that I have used to fill in a lot of the little points along the way. We are right now, I think, at the time just after that war in heaven between Michael and his angels fighting against Satan the devil and his demons. And the devil is down and he's full of wrath. It hasn't come to the final persecution yet. We're not right at the Great Tribulation, but it is next to happen. We're very, very close to it. There isn't much time left. And I think, I thought it was necessary to have that. I might have said some things today about the annual holy days and the festivals of God. But I'm going to hope that God will give me the strength to be back and talk to you tomorrow afternoon, and I'll reserve that for tomorrow. But I, I thought that you needed this message today. You need to know just where we are and what is happening. We need to remember how this church has been resurrected and how God's knowledge has been restored that had been lost while the church slumbered and slept through the Middle Ages. They lost so much of the knowledge of God, it has been restored. Can you realize that, brethren? Now, tonight is the night to be much observed. And it is also a memorial of the Israelites coming out of Egypt as we are to come out of sin. Last night we had a memorial of the death of Christ. We are to remember those things. There was something said in the morning service about remembering these things and why we should, uh, why we should observe and remember the, the dinner that we shall have tonight. We've come to have it with small groups. We tried to all eat at once, and it's too big a group to all eat at once, so you can't do it very well. But uh, I'm having a group at my home. And I presume you all have groups. And we should remember these things. We should remember Christ and his death. We did last night a memorial for his death. We should remember how this church is not just something, just another church. It is something special that God has raised up. God revealed truth to me. And if there's any reason why he chose me, there's only one. It's not because of any righteousness of mine. It's not because of any abilities or powers of mine. I've known scores upon scores of men with better minds than I have, better personality, better appearance, more leadership. I'd say about more of everything that you think of humanly. But God has not called them or used them. Why? Why did he pick on one as inferior as I am? Because I was willing to believe him. Adam and Eve didn't believe him. Jesus Christ talked to thousands who didn't believe him. Only 120 still believed him after Christ had talked for three and a half years to multiple thousands of people. But I did believe him. And I have not compromised with that belief when I ought to. And I've been working hard the last two and a half years to get this church back on the track after others were getting it off the track. I don't think we're a hundred percent back yet. I don't think we have gotten all of the leaven out yet. But it's going out, believe me. And we're going to get it out. And let's not be part of those virgins who don't have any oil in their lamps. If you have any doubt in your mind, begin fasting and praying, asking God to give you his spirit. But his spirit will only open your mind to understand his word. And you will have to follow it. The Holy Spirit is not going to pull you. It's not going to push you. It's not going to compel you. It will show you the way. 
you'll have to begin to want to walk on it in your own power, and you'll have to ask God for extra power and help. Brethren, we're in the very last days, and we need to be sure that we are ready. And I hope that you will all take this very seriously. The things in this world are of no importance from now on at all. Forget them. I used to want to go down and see Laker basketball games. I haven't any time for that anymore. I'm just having to learn to forget everything of that kind. Additional programs and literature available at hwalibrary.com.